that a lot. All God's people, I know, we're church. But, <laughs> but in Jeremiah chapter 29, we know that Jeremiah is a prophet. He says here, this is God speaking to Jeremiah, starting in 2911. He says, God says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me with your, when you search for me with what? All your heart. I will be found by you, says the Lord, and I will bring you back from your captivity. Now, we're not in a captivity like the nation of Israel was, but for us, before we came to the Lord, we were in some type of captivity. For myself, I was in the bondage of alcohol. Others may be in whatever it, it possibly could have been. But little background on the prophet Jeremiah. We know that in the, in the, in the Bible, we have the four major prophets and we have the 12 minor prophets. The only difference between the major and the minor prophets, the majors, of course, is they're much longer. For example, Isaiah is 66 chapters and a, a minor prophet like Jonah is only four chapters. They're all prophets. They were all messengers of God. But, but Jeremiah was a prophet and he lived in the final days of the crumbling nation of Israel. He was actually the last prophet that, that God sent to preach to the southern kingdom, which comprised of the tribes of Judah and the tribes of Benjamin. And God had uh, repeatedly warned Israel to stop their idolatrous behavior, but they, they wouldn't listen. So he tore the 12 tribes apart. He sent the 10 tribes to the north and then the, the other two tribes, of course, to the south. And, and these 10 northern tribes, they fell into the hands of the captivity of the Assyrians. But Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a, a god faithful, fearing man. He was called to tell Israel that because of their unrepented sin that, that God had turned against them and was now prepared to, to remove them from the lands of the hands of the pagan king whom he called, God called Jeremiah in chapter 26, verse 7. He called him my servant. Could you imagine someone coming to you and saying that if you don't turn from your wicked ways, that God is going to turn and walk away from you? But you know, the, the beauty of a Christian today is once you are accepted Jesus, you have been filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in the book of Romans. So the Holy Spirit isn't going to be removed from us. We can quench the Spirit, of course, but we're still filled with the Spirit. The whole time, maybe we walk away, we go back in the world, the Holy Spirit is prompting us and, and, and telling us the things that we're doing wrong. But Jeremiah was called a servant. We're called sojourners, special people as saints. Jeremiah was a young man at this time. He was only about 17 years old when, when God had called him to, who, who had uncertainty over the fate of his people, and he begged them to listen. We also learn from Scripture that, that Jeremiah was called the weeping prophet. We see that in Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 1. And this was based on his wish to have eyes as fountain of tears because he cried tears of sadness, not because of what was about to happen, but because no matter how hard he tried, the people would not listen. It seems like that a lot of times, maybe with a, a family member or a friend or a coworker you're sharing with, and, and you're, 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 you're crying out to them in a way, maybe not in tears like Jeremiah, but <clears throat> you have a, a burning desire in your heart for them to come to know Jesus because you know that if they don't, that one day that if they die and don't know Jesus, that they would end up in hell. But God, God has a different plan. If you go to back up to Jeremiah chapter 18, and let's look at the first six verses. God has a different plan. He's going to give a, a different insight for Jeremiah. He says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord saying, arise and go down to the potter's house. And he says, and there I will cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house and there he was making something at the wheel. 
And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again into another vessel as it seemed good to the potter to make. Then the word of the Lord came to me, came to Jeremiah saying, O house of Israel, how, or, or, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in the hand, O house of Israel. From these verses, we see that, that God has a very unique way to teach Jeremiah a valuable lesson. And some of us here this evening might need a new beginning. I know it's tough to teach a message like this to a group on Wednesday nights. Pastor Darrell used to always tell us, he said, Wednesday nights is the diehard crowd. <laughs> he says, those that come on Wednesday nights are the ones that really want to learn and study the Word of God. It's amazing if you think about it. Most churches, I mean, even the, I've been to probably a dozen different Calvary chapels over the years visiting and so forth, you might get 25% on a Wednesday night. 20 to 25 percent. I will say, the largest percentage of people I've probably ever seen was at Calvary Chapel, Chino Valley, where Pastor Jack Hibbs was a pastor. And you probably, I'm not kidding, you had probably 2,000 people on a Wednesday night. Just mind-blowing, mind-blowing. But where's everybody at? I don't know about them, but I need Jesus every day. <laughs> not just on a Sunday. We need it every day. But God... Our God, the God that we serve, the true and living God, is the God of second chances, and he's truly the God of new beginnings. Have you ever wished that you could go back and, and start over because of something you've said or something you've done? Remember the old saying as kids when we were growing up, sticks and stones may break my bones, but words would never hurt me. That's one of the biggest lies that Satan could ever tell. <laughs> Man, bones will heal, but people can say things, you know. You ever have when, you're, when your children are growing up, they look at you and say, Dad, I hate you. It just tears you apart. I know I had it happen too. But when they get a little older, they come back and they say, Dad, I apologize for what I said. I really love you. And that just melts your heart. But thinking only if I could have taken those words back that I said or maybe if I'd only made some different choices. Unfortunately, we can't always do that. At least not in most cases. It's impossible to, to go back and change things or what was said or done. There is, however, one area of our life that we can. We can have a new beginning, and that is our spiritual life. Yes, our spiritual life. We can have a new beginning or a fresh start. I was doing prison ministry for about six years after we first moved here. I remember one night doing a Bible study up at High Desert State Prison on a Thursday night. And one of the guys looked at me and he said, the world looks at us as losers. I said, I'm going to tell you something, young man. God looks at you as a winner. You're a winner. You came here for a reason. He told me, he says, I'm going to get out of here in two years. He had spent 10 years up there already. He had to do 12 years, he told me. He said, I got two more years to go. I said, you need to get grounded in the Word of God. I said, God brought you here for a reason, my friend. You're here because, think about this, if you weren't here, where would you probably be? And you know what he said to me? In a box. I said, I would be too. Had I not given my life to Jesus? But our spiritual life can have a, a new beginning or a fresh start. But what might one need? We may, a person may need salvation or sanctification or commitment or maybe just contentment. Regardless, God the Father is the one who specializes in new beginnings. <clears throat> what we also see from the scripture is that Jeremiah is a very discouraged young man. And he's about to give up on God's people. You, ever thought, you may have done the same thing. You've been praying for somebody for years and years and years. I read a book, a story one time, where a guy had been praying for these three men. Two of them had given their heart to the Lord. He'd been praying for this other one for 40 years. And he died, and he, of course he would never have known if the guy had given his heart to the Lord, and about two years later he did. We never give up. Doing hospital visits, the same thing. We never give up. That person may be lying, they're dead. But you never, looking like they're dead, but, and they're not. They're still breathing. They can still hear you. I'll tell you a story about my son-in-law. When we were living in Hawaii, when I was at Calvary Pearl Harbor, my daughter Miyoko called me up and she says, Dad, you need to go down to Polymomi Hospital because Mike's father is dying on his deathbed. 
Mike's father was dying of cirrhosis of the liver. If you ever seen Sam Elliott, that's what Mike's father looked like. Had that big bushy mustache and all, just looked just like Sam Elliott. He's laying there. There's Mike's mom, his two sisters, her brother, and his wife. I go there and I introduce myself. They, they knew me because I had married Miyoko and Mike a few months before. And I told Mike who I was. He's laying there. He's got his eyes closed. I said, what I want to do, we want to join hands and we want to pray for you and ask you to accept Jesus, to receive the Lord. And Mike's older sister looks at me. She says, what are you waiting on? Let's pray. <laughs> so we all joined hands and we prayed. I let him, told him about Jesus. What Jesus had done on the cross for him. We said, they said the sinner's prayer. And I walked to the end of the bed, about as far as from here to that music stand. And I bowed my head. And I said, Lord, if Mike is truly given, Michael has truly given his heart to you, does he need to wait any longer to get to heaven? And he died about 30 seconds later. Mike's mother looked at me and said, after you said that prayer, I haven't seen peace come upon him like that ever. But you know, it, it's, it's sad because, we, we think it's sad because we lost that person. But as a Christian, we ought to be rejoicing. Amen. Rejoicing, Amen. knowing that that person is in heaven. In 2008, I had my big trifecta, as I call it, an aneurysm, a stroke, and a heart attack. And I came out of it about 10 days later, and I said, Keiko, why am I still here? I wanted to be in heaven. We'll get there someday. God had different plans. But we see in his scripture that Jeremiah is very discouraged over the nation of Israel. But God has something to show Jeremiah. So he, he tells him to go down to the potter's house where that potter has got the wheel and the, he's shaping that lump of clay and the, the potter's foot is on the treadle and it's going up and down and the wheel is going round and round and as he's shaping that clay and as the clay seemed to be taking shape, something unexpected happened. It became marred in the potter's hand. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly what happened to that clay. It just, we know that it became marred and it became a lump of clay again. If, it, I don't know about you, but if I'd been there as Jeremiah, I'd have probably thrown that piece of clay away and reached down in that jug and that pot and got me a new lump of clay and put it on the, on the potter's wheel and started spinning it and molding it and shaping it. But he doesn't. Instead, the potter, he reforms it, puts it back on there, starts the wheel again, probably puts a little water on it to, 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 to loosen the clay up so he can, can mold it and shape it. And he begins to doing this. And it's this shaping that brings out the, if you think about it, the highest possibilities that the divine potter wants to do for us. God has a personal plan and a, and a purpose for every one of us. You know, church, God knows our possibilities and he knows our desires for every one of us, and he knows exactly what is best for us. Maybe you're disappointed or you're, you're discouraged because your life hasn't shaped up to his will, to, to God's will. It's because you haven't yielded the pressure of his hand. I honestly believe that every Christian is holding on to some type of sin. It's something we won't let go of for whatever reason. Because if we gave 100%, as people say, give, I've given 100% to the Lord. I say, show me how you did that. I don't, I don't know anybody that has given 100%. Let somebody do something wrong, man. I tell you, you can get in the flesh pretty quick. <laughs> At least I can. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I sure can. But God wants to mold us and shape us. I, I remember I'd been sober for about eight months, I'm at this meeting, and, and it was a Christian meeting. You could talk about the Lord at this AA meeting and not worry about getting lynched on the way out the door like you do at the majority of them today. And, and, and I told this lady, I said, I think God's moving too fast. <laughs> she just kind of leaned back in her chair and chuckled, and she said, you think God is moving too fast in your life? You think God doesn't know what he's doing to you, John? Get out of his way and do what he wants. I thought, you know, that's so very true. Too many times we get in the way of the Lord. But God says to his people here, he says, as the clay is in the potter's hands, he says, so are you in my hand. He says, when our plans, when our hopes, when our dreams, or our life doesn't turn out like we desire, when we realize we're flawed, only then can God reshape us. How can God save a sinner who doesn't claim to be a, sin, to be a sinner? 
You have to admit there's a fault to fix anything. You look at your checkbook, your $20 in the red. Oh, what am I going to do? Oh, there's a problem. You need to go to work a little more, right? Not spend so unwisely, whatever it may be. But we, we have to acknowledge there's a problem to fix the problem. But many wish that there was some wonderful place where all our mistakes and all our heartaches and all our selfish griefs could be dropped off and never put on again. I know many of us every day, every night, we lay our, the burdens at the foot of the cross and give it to Jesus. But it seems like before we know it, it's back to that way again. We're having problems. Many have, many have wished for such a place, and we've never found it. You know, they say there's a pot of gold in every, the bottom of every rainbow. Well, when I lived in Hawaii, you'd have two rainbows. And you could drive forever and ever and ever. I mean, the island was only 35 miles long. You're driving in the Pacific Ocean trying to find that rainbow to the bottom. It just didn't work. But we're always trying to find something, some way, somehow, to get rid of our problems. I'll tell you how you get rid of your problems. You pray. You turn it over to the Lord. You read and study the Bible. Try to, try to do the will of the Lord. We can begin again and again by entrusting our, our life into the Master's hands. We can begin again by allowing the Master to, to shape our life by His skilled, purposeful, and loving hands. One might, one might ask, so how do, where, where does all this start? Well, let me give you three suggestions. The first place is right here on earth. We have to start here. Doesn't everybody expect a second chance? We did as growing up. We do as maybe em employers or employees. We do as Christians. We don't always make the right choices. They can contend this is one of the, the marks of God's goodness by God being a God of second chances. They believe man will have the opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ after rejecting him here. They believe that they can go into purgatory, for example, and pray it out of hell, into heaven. I say, show me where it says that in the Bible. It doesn't do that. The only way you can really quench the Holy Spirit is by denying Jesus Christ to your very last breath. But there's not one word in the entire Bible that justifies such a thought as purgatory. Instead, there is warning against delay and false teachings. It's all throughout the New Testament. One might be willing to travel far and at a great cost to find a place to begin and again. Keiko and I was down in Sedona, Arizona a couple weeks ago. I don't know if you've ever been down there. they got these big rocks. You know, it's like the Grand Canyon upside down. And people go up there. You, as you're driving down a highway, you've got people sitting on the rocks. Uh, they got some kind of funky way they do their, their, their hands. But there's supposed to be some kind of power coming up out of this rock. And they got all these dream catchers and all these jewels and, you know, the platinum jewels and so forth. I said, you want power. You need the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only power in the word of God. But people are making millions and millions of dollars off of this phony stuff. But they travel far. We didn't travel to Sedona just to go see these cuckoos on these rocks. <laughs> we went down there to see these friends of ours, a good Christian brother and his wife that used to come to our church. But they're looking. They're looking in all kinds of places. But it's God who brings the chance to start over, over right to our very heart and puts no price on the privilege of entering. All we have to do is call on the name of the Lord, repent of our sins and call on the name of the Lord. And it's some religions... You make a mistake, and it knocks you all the way back down to the bottom of the ladder, and you've got to start over. It's not like that with us. With us, we repent of our sins, and we turn, and we come back. You know, it's unfortunate. You probably know somebody that had been walking with the Lord for years. We had a, a bass player when I was at Calvary Pearl Harbor. Great brother in the Lord, at least we thought. I hadn't seen him for about a year, year and a half. And I'm down at the ramen shop down in Pearl City. And I said, hey, man, where you been? I left. I said, where are you going to church? He says, I don't. I said, what do you mean you don't? You need to get back. You need to go back running. Go back fast. Because you're denying the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit's been telling you to go back. I told him, I said, there's nothing you've done now, or even you did in the, before the first time you claimed to accept the Lord, that Jesus won't take you back. He accepts us just the way we are. 
He provides a door, the way to begin again, and this door is open to anyone who will enter it. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, he says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. Any person, whether saved or unsaved, who, who feels that, this, that their life is ruined by their sin has the gospel invitation. It's open to everyone. You know the cool thing about it is? It doesn't matter who you worship before you got here. You could have been a satanic worshiper. You could have been a Muslim, a Jehovah Witness. You could have been a Mormon, a Buddhist, whatever it may have been. And you come and you hear the gospel. You hear the love and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And you call in the name of the Lord. You confess with your mouth and you believe in your heart. Like the Bible says, it says you will be saved. It makes you wonder, what's so important in a person's life when they hear the gospel that they keep saying no? Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, the prophet said, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord, though your sins are like scarlet, and they shall be white as snow, though they are red and like crimson, they shall be as wool. In Psalms 103, 12, it says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. You know, you can go east forever and ever and ever and ever and never hit west, but you can't go north to south because as soon as you hit the North Pole, you take a step, you're heading in the southern direction. As far as the east is from the west, just by calling on the name of the Lord and believing it. One of the most beautiful facts related to salvation is the cleansing and the removing of our past and our, and our, our new life for the future. God offers us a chance to start all over again. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, he says, therefore, therefore, because it's therefore something. <laughs> he says, if anyone is in Christ, he says he is a new creation. And all things have passed away. Not just a couple things. All things have passed away. And behold, all things have become new. You tell someone that's maybe struggled with alcohol, you know the world wants them to think that you're going to be an alcoholic for the rest of your life. I tell them I'm a recovered alcoholic. And they look at me like, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> I said, well, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says that all things have become new, Paul tells us, by believing in Jesus Christ. So that means it's gone. God also offers a chance to begin again to all backslidden Christians, the ones who started well but yielded to the ways of the world, in other words, to their flesh. Satan sure makes the world look good, don't it? You know, I remember when we first moved here, there was the motto in Vegas, of course, and it still is, Sin City. What happens in Vegas stays in, in Vegas. Well, you'd be driving down 15 or 95, there'd be great big billboards up there. It says, what happens in Vegas? In big letters, it said, God knows. <laughs> I said, how true that is. God knows. And it doesn't, it's not just Sin City, Las Vegas. It's Sin City, wherever you go in this world. And what happens in Vegas can be in London, England this afternoon or tonight. It's going to, our transportation today, I mean, it's, it's crazy with the way this world thinks. But before clay's is, excuse me, clay is glazed and fired, the potter may reshape and redo the pottery until it's shaped to the potter's perfection. You think about this when, as, as you've been walking with the Lord, God's been molding and shaping you to become that man or that woman of Jesus Christ, to become more and more like his son. We're never going to be like Jesus, 100% on the face of, the, well, down here on this earth, but when we get to heaven, when we get our new bodies, we're going to have perfect bodies, and we're going to be just like Jesus. How great that's going to be. That is what Jeremiah saw when God instructed him to go into the potter's house. He saw the potter working with the clay, it got marred, so the potter had to reshape it and, and, and remake it. And God says, that's exactly what I'm trying to do to you. Quit kicking against the goads, so to speak. Church, we're the one that is flawed and marred. We are that lump of clay on that potter's wheel. And God says, I want to reshape you. But there's only one thing. We got to let him. We got to quit fighting it. If God knows everything about us and he knows everything that's good for us, we, if he wants to take something away, 
He does. I enjoyed the game of golf more than any game I've ever played in my life. I was even getting pretty good at it. I was down to about a 6 to an 8 handicap, and I hurt my back. I had a lady tell me, even when I was in rehab, she said, you're addicted to golf. I said, you could have told me I was addicted to alcohol. It wouldn't have bothered me. I knew that, but addicted to golf, I mean, that really rubbed me the wrong way. But I was. I was living in the golf of, of, of the capital of the world. I was living in Hawaii. You, know, you could play three, four days a week and go to the driving range a couple of days a week. But I started getting good. And what it was doing, it was starting to affect my time with the Lord. And the Lord hurt my back. I, I went to reach down to pick up a piece of trash on the ground out in front of the, the church in Pearl Harbor. And my back popped. And it has never been right since. I played golf twice in 11 years. God says, you don't need that golf. I need Jesus. We all need Jesus. But Jeremiah saw that God had instructed him to go to the potter's house. And he saw the potter working with the clay and it got marred. God says, I want to reshape you. But we got to quit fighting against him. And God offered, as you read the Old Testament, God offered the Israelites a chance to begin again and again and again and again. Every time they would turn and come back to the Lord, God would forgive them of their sin. Read Judges. Read Joshua. It's just time and time again. Moses told them before he died what you had to do. If you do this, God will do this. But if you don't do this, this is what's going to happen, folks. Joshua tells them the same thing. They still, they turn and went to their own ways. It's the same way with today. People sit in church hours on end, and they hear the word of God. But when they leave, for some reason, they want to fall back into the ways of the world. But God offers us the opportunity to begin again by yielding our life to his skilled, purposeful, and loving hands. Yet it is this place and time where we must begin again. The second thing is that new beginning, it starts right now. We have to make that choice. I know we're 33 days away from a New Year's, but we can start making that New Year's resolution. What are we going to do? Think about the last almost 11 months where you went wrong. At what point did I, maybe I was going to read my Bible in chronological order for a year. I was going to spend 30 minutes a day, whatever it may have been. I was going to get involved in maybe the children's ministry or the worship ministry. Sorry, Don, I can't do the worship. I can't sing. I told you, if I'd have turned this on when I was back there singing, the guitar would have went out of tune. So, <laughs> But the longer that one stays in the world, the longer that one stays off the potter's wheel and out of the, the, the loving and, and, and molding and shaping hands of the Lord, the harder it is to work the clay. It's going to dry. It's going to get hard. The clay becomes dry like the heart. And without the, the true word of God, the water of life, you're going to become a hardened, hearted person. And there's many people in this world who started strong and walked away for whatever reason. And most are unwilling to start over, or at least not today, for whatever reason that may be. You ever heard of a guy named Charles Templeton? He was an evangelist with Billy Graham. And one day he went back to, not picking on you, Dan, but he went back to Canada. He went back to Canada and he decided that what I've been teaching, I don't believe. And he became an agnostic. And right before he died, a guy by the name of Lee Strobel interviewed him. And Charles Templeton said to him then, he said, I never had a relationship and a love for anybody like I had with Jesus Christ, but I don't believe what I was teaching was true. How sad that can be. How sad. But a fresh start can happen Right now, it becomes harder and harder. And there's many people in the world who, like I said, started strong. A new beginning with God can start anywhere. We don't have to do it right here in the church. We can do it at home. We can do it at work. We can be thinking about it. No matter what you've done, whom you may or may not have worshipped or where you've been, now is the time, I believe, for a new beginning. And with God, you don't have to wait until you become back into that fully molded, shaped lump of clay. And the, and the moment that, that one yields their life into the shaping pressure of the divine potter, that is the moment that his or her skilled, purposeful, and loving hands, God is going to bring you back into that fold by allowing him, <clears throat> excuse me, allowing him 
to mold you. At that precise moment in time, God begins the process of reshaping or or rebuilding the life that you once had. And there's no better time, I believe, for a new beginning than at the beginning of a new year. But we need to start now. Find out what we didn't do right and what we're going to do for the year 2018. And the third thing is that God honors those who begin again. You ever notice, even the day, you, the first time you gave your heart to the Lord, I don't know, whatever the condition it may have been in, it's very unfortunate that most people don't come to the Lord until something is happening in their life. I went to, a, to church as a kid. I remember when I was 13 years old and got saved in a Calvary Baptist church down in Denton, Texas, I thought. I went forward. I, I, I got baptized. I did everything they said. But you know what was sad? I was 13. I've been drinking for two years before that. I started at the ripe young age at 11. Nobody told me until I was 43 years old, 30 years later, that Christianity wasn't a religion. Christianity was a relationship. I had never in my life heard the Bible taught chapter by chapter, verse by verse, until I listened to the study by Pastor Daryl Skinner in the Persian Gulf. I'd never heard the Bible taught that way. And he had told us that in his teachings, that Christianity wasn't a religion, but a relationship. I, I wanted that relationship more than ever. I'd been a, I, I was a mason in the, in the Scottish Rite and had gone as far as the Shriners. And I remember reading a book. And at the end of this book, it's, it, it talked about the cultish the cults of these three different lodges. And I prayed and I said, Lord, your word says I can only serve one master. I have to make that choice. It's you or the master of the lodge or the shrine or the Scottish rite. I said, Lord, it's you. Take this desire away from me. And I've never been back. I denied it. I turned it away. But God honors those who who begin again The Apostle Peter, he made a good beginning, but we know that as he went on, he yielded to outward pressure. He eventually realized his failure. He knew that he was marred, but God had had made him over again, giving him a new beginning. And though Peter's obedient love for Jesus, he began again, and God reshaped him throughout the rest of his life. You know, you think, how could a guy walk away? They'd been a Christian. Hey, these guys, 11 of the 12, one of them the, the, the turned uh, Christ over as a tra- as the traitor for Christ. He died. The other 10, they scattered. They were with Jesus for three years. It can happen to anybody. We shouldn't look down on a person that that happens to. What we do, we should be praying for that person to come back, interceding for that person. Saul, who later became Paul, he was, he was determined in a way of persecution. He'd given his very life to religious preparation and was preserving uh, or persevering with great determination in the way that he had chosen for himself. Suddenly, as the light of Jesus Christ shone upon his, his inner man, he was caused to see his mistake, and he was making, and he started all over again. Although once so marred that he persecuted Jesus in his church, he became pliable in the master's hands, and, and God had made him over again. He even changed his name to Paul, from Saul to Paul. Church, our God is in the transformation business He sees us in the potential to be a vessel of honor. He doesn't need gold or silver or or, or for us to be a superstar or a millionaire or the the big name person. God simply says, come, come. I I honestly believe that if there was 100 steps to salvation, God has already taken 99 of them. He reaches out with his hand and he says, come. But so unfortunate that many people will not receive the hand of Jesus Christ. But you know something? God is in the business of of making glory out of garbage, out of making riches into rubble, out of rubble, making diamonds out out of dust, and the list can go on and on and on and on. But God also builds his church with misfits. I think maybe that's why I like Calvary Chapel so much. There's a whole bunch of us that are ex-drunks, drug addicts, ex-cons, and so forth. We've been there. We've, We've seen it. You know, I was telling Pastor Kurt, I've, I've been able to go down to the Las Vegas Rescue Mission and teach for uh, the last couple months. And the beauty of it is I can relate to every one of them. <laughs> I, 
I haven't, lived, had to, haven't had to live on a street that causes from a lot of bad choices in life. But I get to go down there and I get to share. I get to tell them about Jesus. And they see somebody standing up there that's been through some of the same struggles and problems that they have. And they look up to you and say, hey, I can relate to what you're saying. But you know, God says, give me a dreamer like Joseph. And he says, I'm going to turn him into a co-commander over Egypt. God says, give me a captive like, like Daniel. And he says, I'm going to turn him into a prayer warrior. He says, give me a shepherd boy like David. And he says, I'll turn him into a king. God says, give me a child like Jeremiah. And he says, I'll turn him into a prophet. Give me a fisherman like Peter. And he says, I'll turn him into an apostle. Or give me a persecutor like Saul. And he says, I'm going to turn him into a preacher. And he says, I'm going to change his name to Paul. I'm going to help him get the point across to them Gentiles. That's what Paul did. He went out there and preached to them Gentiles. Or give me an adulterer like the woman at the well. And God says, I'll turn her into an evangelist. God says, allow me to use you. And he says, I'll make you a Sunday school teacher, a street evangelist. How about a worship leader? How about a home fellowship Bible study leader? Or even a pastor. And the list, again, can go on and on and on and on. One just needs to make their self available. You see... All God needs is a piece of marred clay. The problem is, many people think they're better than that. I don't know about anybody else, but I'm just a sinner saved by the grace of God. That's all I am. I never want to forget where I used to be and where I'm at today and where I'm going to be someday. Being a Christian don't pay much, but I'll tell you what, the retirement is awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. I want to close with this story. It's called a cracked pot. A water bearer had two large pots, each hung on each end of a pole, which he carried across his neck. One of the pots had a crack in it, and while the other pot was perfect and always delivered a full portion of water, at the end of the long walk from the stream to the master's house, the cracked pot arrived only half full. For a full two years, this went on daily, and with the bearer delivering only one and a half pots of water in his master's house. The perfect pot was proud of its accomplishments, perfect to the end for which it was made. But the poor cracked pot was ashamed of his own imperfection and miserable that it was able to accomplish only half of what it had been made to do. After two years of what it perceived to be a bitter failure, it spoke to the water bearer one day by the stream saying, I'm ashamed of myself, and I want to apologize to you. Why, asked the bearer, what are you ashamed of? He says, well, I've, I've, I've been able for these past two years to deliver only half my load because this crack in my side causes water to leak out all the way back to your master's house. He says, because of my flaws, you, you have to do all this work, and you don't get full value for the efforts, the pot says. The water Bearer felt sorry for that cracked, old cracked pot and his compassion, he said. As we return to the master's house, he says, I want you to notice the beautiful flowers along the path. He says, indeed, as they went up the hill, the old cracked pot took notice of the sun warming the beautiful wild flowers on the side of the path, and his, this cheered it some. But at the end of the trail, it still felt bad because it had leaked out half its load, and so again it apologized to the water bearer for its failure. The water bearer said to the pot, Did you notice that there were flowers only on your side of the path, but not on the other pot's side? He says, That's because I've always known about your flaw, and I took advantage of it. I planted flower seeds on your side of the path, and every day while we walk back from the stream, you've watered them. For two years, I've been able to pick these beautiful flowers to decorate my master's table. Without you being just the way you are, he would not have this beauty to grace his house. Church, each one of us, has their own unique flaws. We're all crack pots, so to speak. <laughs> I know that sounds kind of rough, right? Ooh, crack pots. But if we, if we would just humble ourselves and submit fully to the Lord, Jesus will use our flaws to grace his Father's table because in God's great economy, nothing will ever, ever go to waste. So as a New Year is quickly approaching us, we... I, I would encourage you to, to make a goal. Better yet, make a, a goal to seek ways to minister together. And as God calls us to tasks as he's appointed, let's not be afraid of our flaws. You know, as I've been here these last three months, I've heard Pastor Kirk and 
and, and, and Bruce, when he's doing announcements, you know, they're about ladies' ministry and the men's ministry and uh, a ministry they want to get started up or they want to go out on uh, a couple days of the week. They go out and tell people about Jesus, invite them to come to church. I remember when I was in Hawaii that at Calvary Chapel, Honolulu, one of the guys down there, that was exactly what he did on Saturdays. Him and a, three or four other guys, they would get together and they would be in pairs, of course. And he said, why should the JWs have so much fun? He says, we're going to do it too. And they would go out and, and of course, you know, they're probably people looking through that peephole. You know, they think for sure it's a JW. And then someone comes and shares the love of Christ. You know, it was like Pastor Kurt was saying, I have never, ever had a honest, believing Christian come to my, my house. I did have over the last couple of months some JWs. They find out Keiko's Japanese and all the Japanese speaking JWs come. And then I had some Mormon, two ladies come here about a year ago, and they find out that I was a pastor at Calvary Chapel. The word got out pretty fast. They, they stopped coming. You know, I even had one of the Mormons tell me that we believe Jesus is the Son of God. I said, well, you need to read your doctrine because that's not what, it, what it, it's, it's out there. She's, the, the, the young lady says, we don't have doctrine in our church. I said, i tell you what you do. Next time you go back to, I said, I don't know, whatever you call that place where you go on Sundays. I don't know if it was a tabernacle or a synagogue. I have no idea what it is. I said, you ask one of them guys down there if you don't have doctrine. I said, I can't uh, hardly imagine they're sending you out here not knowing something like that. But, you know, there's so many things to get involved. We, 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 we need to make ourselves available. Yeah, I was telling the guys last night, I said, you know, and back in my days of drinking, I'd spend four, five, six hours a night doing it, going out and boozing it up. Why can't I spend an hour a day now reading and studying the Word of God? You know, I've had some people tell me, they said, man, I, I, I don't like to read. I said, you need to get on your hands and knees and ask God to give you the ability and want to read. I said, there is no book, better book than what you're reading right here. You know, you get you a good commentary, you get you a good dictionary, and, and you learn how to read the Bible. Take a class like on inductive Bible studying and so forth. Learn how to read the Bible. Many people read the Bible and they don't even realize that the book of Romans and the book of Colossians was two churches Paul had never, ever visited when he wrote the letters. It's amazing as you read and study the Word of God. And, the, and, and when you read the Old Testament and find out how much of the Old Testament is, is all about Jesus Christ. I know, the Wednesday night crowd, preaching to the choir. <laughs> Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this beautiful and blessed evening. And I thank you, Lord, for Pastor Kurt giving me this opportunity to share your word this evening. Lord, we so often at times feel just like that lump of clay on the potter's wheel. We feel used and abused. And sometimes, Lord, we even feel like you just throw us away and you start all over again. But Father, you love us just the way we are. The thing about it is, Lord, you know when we're going to make mistakes. You know when the potter's going to have to smash us down and start all over again. You know everything about us. So, Lord, I pray that as this new year begins, that we not just make a new year resolution, we make a new year resolution to our problems, to help us to draw closer and closer to you to learn more about you. I pray, Lord, that our love and our wisdom and our understanding of you would grow more and more as each and every day goes by. And I pray, Lord, that in this next year to come that anyone that comes within our path that doesn't know you, Lord Jesus, as their Lord and Savior, as your Holy Spirit prompts us to share with them, to tell someone at Walmart or Sam's Club or Costco, wherever we may go, Hey, Merry Christmas, Jesus loves you. And as that new year begins, we tell them about Jesus. Letting that light that's within us shine out, just like that lighthouse. A lighthouse for you, Lord Jesus. We love you, we thank you, and we ask these things in Jesus' name. And all God's church said, amen. Thank you, folks. Thank you very much.